I'm Adam Winkler. I'm a professor of law at UCLA School of Law here in Los Angeles and the author of Gunfight, The Battle of the Right to Bear Arms in America. I think it is. I think it's designed to protect a democratic people. I think the framers of the Second Amendment really sincerely feared that a government that disarmed the people would be a tyrannical government that would run roughshod over their liberty. That was their experience with James II. It was their experience with King George III and the colonies who tried to disarm the rebellious colonies. Um, so I think that it did try to protect a, a view of democratic self-governance that the framers thought was not possible. But things change with the 14th Amendment. I do think that one of the mistakes we make is overemphasizing the Second Amendment and not recognizing the importance of the 14th Amendment. For whatever the framers of the Second Amendment thought, and there's been a lot of dispute about that, it's pretty clear that the framers of the 14th Amendment sought to protect the right of individuals to have guns for their own personal self-protection. And it's a great story that I tell in Gunfight about um, the rise of the KKK as a gun control organization. In the Civil War, before the Civil War, in the South, blacks were never allowed to own guns, right? Completely barred from owning guns. But what happens in the war is blacks arm up for the first time. Some fight for the Union Army, and the Union Army, who owes its soldiers uh, back wages uh, and can't pay them, allows the soldiers to take home their guns if they wish. So the black soldiers take home their guns. Um, other blacks in the South who don't fight are easily able to buy guns on the black market, which is literally flooded with the hundreds of thousands of firearms that had been manufactured for the war, but were, once the war ended, no longer needed. So blacks arm up in the South because they know that whites are not going to give up on their view of white supremacy too easily. And the KKK and other groups form to go out at night and take away those guns from the freedmen because they knew as long as the freedmen had guns, they'd be able to fight back and they wouldn't be as subservient as whites wanted them to be. The framers of the 14th Amendment clearly thought that by protecting the privileges or immunities of citizenship, including, as they said in numerous, numerous times on the floor of the Senate and the House, including the right of the people to keep and bear arms, they were trying to protect the right of the freedmen to be free from disarmament efforts by state and local governments. Things like the Black Code, which barred blacks from a whole series of constitutional rights including their right to keep and bear arms. So the 14th Amendment, in fundamental ways, protects an individual's right to own firearms for personal self-defense, perhaps even more so than the Second Amendment uh, as it was originally understood and meant by the framers. The role of the 14th Amendment was not central to the Heller case and the Heller decision, which was really focused on whether the federal government, which is bound by the Second Amendment, was restricted in its ability to ban handguns or other kinds of gun control laws. It was the McDonald case, decided in 2010, that fundamentally relied on the 14th Amendment because the question in that case was, did the founders of the 14th Amendment intend to protect the right of the people to keep and bear arms free from state and local interference. And the court said that it did. One of the most remarkable things uh, I found in my research for gunfight was the profound role that race and racism has played in our approach to guns. The founding fathers who wrote the Second Amendment supported laws restricting, uh, on the basis of race, gun ownership. Like I said earlier, slaves and free blacks even who otherwise had most of the rights, were not allowed to uh, own firearms. The KKK begins in some ways as a gun control organization with its primary strategy in its early days to take away the guns of black people so that they couldn't fight back. Um, and that element of race and racism goes throughout our history uh, and our approach to guns. In the 1960s, um, I tell a great story of how the Black Panthers inspired the rise of the modern gun rights movement that it was laws that were passed in the 1960s to disarm black leftist radicals, urban black leftist radicals, that ironically sparked um, a backlash and resentment among rural white conservatives. And the NRA becomes radicalized in the 1970s, if you will, uh, and becomes a much more diehard, uh, no compromises uh, organization when it comes to gun control. And in part, they're responding to laws that were adopted by, among uh, uh, 
conservative Republicans, including Governor Ronald Reagan here in California, laws that they supported, uh, along with liberals, to disarm African Americans. So race has played a really fundamental um, role in how we thought about and how we approached guns from our earliest days. Well, the NRA has really shifted a lot and changed and transformed dramatically. And so I tell the story in the book also of how the NRA back in the 1920s and 30s used to be the nation's leading gun control organization, that they used to draft and promote gun control laws, and in fact drafted and promoted uh, a wave of restrictions on concealed carry of firearms that swept the nation in the 20s and 30s, um, thanks to the help of the NRA. The NRA today tries to invalidate and overturn those very same laws that it supported um, 80 years ago. And the NRA, um, as the NRA histories will officially admit, uh, really transformed in 1977. That in the 1970s, uh, there was an effort by leadership to retreat from political advocacy, to uh, close up their Washington lobbying office, uh, and to become much more focused on outdoor activities, hunting and shooting, recreational stuff, um, in, with a new headquarters in Colorado Springs. And that helped inspire a group of hardline gun rights activists who didn't agree with leadership to actually mount a hostile takeover, a coup d'etat, if you will, of the NRA at the 1977 annual meeting of the membership. And this new hardline hard group takes over, uh, recommits the NRA to political advocacy, takes a much more hardline, no compromises approach to gun control, and becomes the political powerhouse that we know today. I'm not sure the, how exactly they have uh, impacted the issues of race. I don't think that gun control today is primarily designed with race in mind. I think that's somewhat of a historical relic. It's not exclusive. I think that uh, you might see race pop up here and there. Uh, we haven't moved be completely beyond our uh, obsession with race in America. Um, so we'll see those things continue to pop up, but they haven't really been central to the gun debate these days. Indeed, part of the problem is that it's very difficult to, to see which way the gun debate is moving because it doesn't seem to move at all these days. There is a real stalemate in American politics over guns. You had Barack Obama coming into office, many people in the gun control community believing he would adopt new vigorous gun control regulations. But in fact, President Obama has seemed very reluctant to do so and has indeed liberalized uh, access to guns in a variety of ways since he's been in office. Um, passed some new restrictions too through regulation, but it hasn't been quite the same um, as it once was. There are still though, if you go to a gun show and still find, go through the literature of the really hardline extremists in the gun debate, you'll see plenty of obsession with race and racism. A lot of people have not still given up the battles for white supremacy. The NRA is obviously the leader of the gun rights movement, but they, they've been very quiet about the Heller case for a variety of reasons, some very expected. They fought tooth and nail to scuttle this Heller lawsuit. They did not want the Supreme Court to rule on this case. Uh, when the libertarian lawyers first brought the idea uh, to the NRA and said, we're thinking about challenging this law, they tried to convince them to drop it, or if they were going to pursue the case to add in other kinds of claims that weren't Second Amendment claims so that the courts could rule on some other issue other than the Second Amendment. When that didn't work, they tried to mount a hostile takeover of the litigation, where they would uh, derail the litigation, if you will, to focus on non Second Amendment issues, other issues other than the Second Amendment. Um, that didn't work. They tried to get a law passed through Congress, and surprisingly, the NRA, as strong as it was, was not able to get a law passed through con Congress that would overturn DC's laws and moot the idea of a Supreme Court case. So they fought against the tooth and nail. They only came around really at the very last minute once the Supreme Court had already agreed to hear the case. They did help Alan Gura at the very end. But ever since then, they've been a little bit quiet about the Heller case, haven't really talked as much about it as perhaps one might expect. But that uh, Alan Gura has his own theory as to why that was, and he told me that you know, he thinks that the NRA was so opposed to his lawsuit, not just because they were protecting their turf, but because they were afraid of two things. One, they were afraid of losing and having a conservative Supreme Court uh, dismiss their view of the Second Amendment. Seven of nine justices on the Supreme Court when the Heller case was decided were Republican appointees. So they didn't want them to come out against them. But Gura suspected there was another reason. 
that they might be afraid of winning. <laughs> that if they won, government would be disbarred from uh, taking all the guns away. And the most successful fundraising strategy the NRA has employed over the last 30, 40 years is to tell gun owners, you have to contribute now because your gun rights are slipping away. The government's coming to take your guns. You better help us fight them. Um, Gurth suspected that the NRA was afraid of losing that major fundraising appeal. Uh, and indeed, there's many ways in which the NRA seems not to really acknowledge the Heller case and still seems to tell gun owners, Obama's coming to get your guns, even though the Supreme Court has said, we won't let them. There was a move um, a few years back, maybe in the, in the mid-1990s, uh, a move by gun control organizations to get rid of guns through the back channel. And the back channel was, well, we can't get any laws passed that restrict gun ownership, really. So what we're going to do is get a, we're going to go to court and say that guns are defective products, like a Ford Pinto that explodes when it gets into a car accident and kills all its passengers. Uh, and if it's a defective product, the manufacturers will have to owe a lot of money to victims of gun violence, so much money, um, because the injuries are so devastating, that they would be basically forced out of business. And no one would be able to sell guns in America without a huge liability risk. Um, these cases didn't go very far. Number one, because as courts uh, frequently ruled, it's hard to say a gun is a defective product. It does exactly what it's supposed to do, which is to fire a projectile at a super high speed uh, to uh, injure or, or kill someone or something um, if that thing is a danger to the owner of uh, the gun. In the same way, a knife is not defective, even though there's about 2,000 people every year who are killed by knives. Uh, they're not defective because they're doing exactly what the manufacturer intended, which was uh, to provide a sharp blade. So these didn't go very far in court, and the NRA was strong enough to get uh, finally a federal law passed that banned these lawsuits uh, and said as a matter of federal law, uh, guns are not defective products simply because they fire a projectile. Obviously, you can have a defectively manufactured gun and there'll be liability for such a thing if it's indeed manufactured in a defective way, uh, but not for a gun that's manufactured appropriately, but someone is just unhappy with the results. I think one of the bad parts of this move was that I don't think it was really well thought out at the time, um, because what it all, all, all it did was convince the gun owners that the gun control people really do want, just want to get rid of the guns any way, shape, or form, and will stop at nothing to do so. So it only strengthened the gun rights movement rather than diminished its power. So I think it was one of those things that, um, uh, like a defective product, backfired on uh, the gun control uh, and their credibility in the gun debate. Thank you very much for having me.